having earned both his bachelor's and master's degree from North Carolina Central University, Lavelle Moulton has truly been a fine example of our founder's motto, truth in service. As the head coach of North Carolina Central University's men's basketball team, Coach Moulton has led us not only to a MEAC championship, but gave us our first ever visit to the NCAA Big Dance in Basketball. Coach teaches his players that life is bigger than the court and that they have to make their mark on the world by being good men. One of Coach Moten's favorite quotes is, adversity introduces a man or woman to themselves. Lavelle lives out the meaning of those words every day. He is a man of God, a husband, a father, a mentor, a published author, and a philanthropist. Coach also says, basketball is what I do. It is not who I am. So that is why for the past seven years, he and his childhood friend, P.J. Tucker, have held an annual back to school community day at the Boys Club of Raleigh, where he grew up. This year, that back to school drive served over 1,300 people to get them ready to get back to school. His upcoming third annual single mother salute is a way for him to pay tribute to his mother Hattie, who raised him and his brother Earl and other single mothers in the triangle who are doing whatever it takes to raise their children. Coach is our first keynote speaker of the 40 Under 40 Gala. So this is a first for us. Let's give it up for Coach. So we are indeed blessed to have this wonderful man, not only as our keynote speaker tonight, but as an alumnus of this prestigious university as our men's basketball head basketball coach and as a pillar in our community. Please welcome to the stage our keynote speaker for the evening, Lavelle Moten. Right, thank you. Good evening, how you doing? Um, real fast, I know this was said before, but I'd be remiss if I don't say it right now. Um, please keep Chancellor Saunders right uh, in your prayers. Even when you leave here, not only tonight, but tomorrow as well. Uh, thank you, Angelique. And thank you, Shatanda. And um, I think my AD is in here somewhere, but there's so many people, I can't find her. Ingrid Wickham McCree, I think she's. Hey, Ingrid, there she go. Um, Dr. Akelie, um, we were just talking, and I know the transition is crazy for you right now. You wear the provost hat and the chancellor's hat, so thank you for your blessing. You've been a blessing to the university and anything that we can do in a collaborative effort, you know, let me know to help out. So thank you for all you do. Um, when I sat down beside him, he said, you got a baby face. You don't even look your age. How do you maintain that? I said, it's the off season. <laughs> By December, I'll be looking like Grady from Sanford and something. <laughs> uh, and before I get ahead of myself, that was, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't think um, my lovely wife, I get a lot more credit than I, I, I deserve, but um, while I'm out there on that road, she absolutely holds the fort down, so um, I definitely, I'll kick my coverage, as the fellas say, so thank you, babe, wave your hand to me, say something to me. I'm extremely blessed, and um, every day I wake up, you know, one of my prayers is, God, just thank you for allowing me to return to my alma mater and coach my alma mater. Um, I, I feel kind of old up here because I think it was just three or four years ago, I was like the first, one of the first honorees, I was in that first class, but I was 39 at the time. So I barely made it. I was like that senior that needed a C to graduate. <laughs> 
and I was struggling, so I barely made it. But congratulations to all the 40 under 40 uh, nominees. I saw you guys back there. You guys look beautiful, and uh, I'm extremely proud of you. Um, I thank God for, for giving me a vision beyond my uh, present set of circumstances. The one thing about being a basketball coach that I don't like too much is every time somebody sees you, they want to talk about basketball. <laughs> And I understand it, but I love getting the opportunity to talk to people about something else other than basketball because basketball is two hours of what I do. I got 22 hours of my life that I must live. And just to take you on this journey with me, I don't really give speeches. I just get up and tell my story. And hopefully you can extract some knowledge and nuggets from that and apply to your daily life, your personal life, or your professional life. But I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, actually, in a housing project called Orchard Park. And, um, you know, it's just to paint that picture for you, there was a movie called New Jack City. That movie was based off my housing project. And the irony behind that is the writer of that movie was a guy by the name of Barry Michael Cooper, who was a North Carolina Central graduate. And so it got too rough up there. Basically, we moved down to Raleigh, North Carolina. And my grandmother was here. And my grandmother was a very spiritual woman. I mean, very spiritual. She went to church seven days a week. Y'all know that grandmother. That was my grandmother. Hard as gold. And oftentimes she would ask me to pray with her. And she prayed the same way Reggie played. It was so fluent. And I was a kid. I would get on one knee with her and I would close my eyes. And she ended every prayer with kids, kids. She always asked God, please pray for my kids, kids. Please bless my kids, kids. And I would just repeat that. And I always ask my grandmother, why do you always pray for your kids' kids? And she said, you'll understand one day. One day we went to church, and I had stole some peppermint out of her pocketbook. And there was one of the older church women named Miss Shirley. And she saw me get that peppermint out of my grandma's pocketbook. And she just stared at me, and I just dropped it back. And she came over, and Miss Shirley just kept staring at me. She walked up on me, and she told my grandmother, she said, how old is he? And my grandmother said, six. She said, he has the gift of foresight. He's a visionary, he has the gift of foresight. And she just walked away. And I asked my grandma, what's that? I'm, I'm a visionary, I got the gift of foresight. And she said, well, you can see things other people can't see. And she said, Miss Shirley knows these things because Miss Shirley is the lady in the church that they said had the gift of prophecy. So I said, I can see things like superpowers? She's like, no, 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 no. She's like, you're a visionary. It's kind of like superpowers, but she said it's a blessing and a curse to be a visionary. She said, because when you're a visionary, you can see things other people can't see. That's the gift. But the curse is you're gonna have to stand in it alone. So I never forgot that. And I went home and I told my mom, I said, Mom, Grandma said I was a visionary. A lady at church, Miss Shirley, said I was a visionary. And so my mom, before I went to bed that night, she said, stay right there. She came back and she handed me two sheets of paper. One was her birth certificate, the other was mine. And she said, this is why they said that. So she said, look at this and tell me what you think. And I'm just looking at her birth certificate and I'm looking at mine. I said, oh no, it's just two birth certificates. She said, no, let me show you something. And this was the day that I knew my knife was anointed. I didn't know what I was gonna be, but after looking at this paper, she showed me something. She said, my birthday is June 16th. Your birthday is June 16th. I said, well, I knew that. She said, I was born in 1947. You were born in 1974. She said, I was born at 5.06 a.m. You were born at 5.06 a.m. So from that day, I knew my life was anointed. Just from that June 16, 1974, hers 1947, we both, 5.06 a.m. I knew my life was anointed. I didn't know what I was gonna be, but I knew it was anointed. I entered a Pepsi Hot Shot contest at the boys club. And when I walked, it was just a bunch of banners a two liter Pepsi up there, and I saw a couple people competing that was my age, and I said, I'm not entering that, that's corny. And they said, well, whoever wins gets that two liter Pepsi. I said, well, sign me up, where do I enter? <laughs> I needed that two liter Pepsi. 
So I had a bunch of 10 year olds trying to explain to me how this competition went. And then one of my mentors, Ron Williams, just came up and he said, look man, you got a minute to shoot from every spot, just make all of them. I said, cool. I did that and I won the contest. What I didn't know about the contest, that was in Raleigh. The next week I had to go to Charlotte and shoot for the state. I went there and I won. Then I had to go to Atlanta and shoot in the southeastern region, and I won that. And what I didn't know in Atlanta, whoever won that competition had an opportunity to go shoot in D.C. at halftime of the Washington Bullets game at that particular time. But while I was there, I also met the president, Ronald Reagan at the time. I also saw the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument. And it was my first time out of the projects. It's the first time I was out of that four block radius that I had ever seen anything. So my family was watching me at 10 years old shoot at halftime of a Bullets game. I ended up being the best shooter in the world at 10 years old. So when I came home, they had a little mini parade in the hood for me. You can only imagine how that was. <laughs> the float wouldn't flow. There was... But I told my grandma, I said, one day, I'm gonna buy you that big house. One day I'm gonna buy you a car. And one day I'm gonna fill your bank account up with a lot of money so you'll never ever have to work again. The next thing she told me in her life is something I'll never forget. She said, I want you to remember something. The two most important days of your life is the day that you were born and the day that you figure out why. And when you leave this earth, if people remember you as a good basketball player, then you've done a poor job of living. I never forgot that. On March 1st, 1986, I walked into my home and I saw my mom on the floor. She was crying like she was three years old. My grandmother had passed. Most devastating thing ever to me. It's really difficult to talk about it even to this day. I'm probably putting some family business out right now that I probably don't supposed to say, but oh well. My mother is the youngest of six. And my wife say this all the time. She said, I've never seen nothing like this. My mother is the youngest of six. My grandmother passed March 1st, 1986. She has three brothers, two sisters. She hasn't spoken to her brothers or her sisters since March 1st, 1986. As a kid, I didn't understand why. It was kind of like the movie Soul Food where when Big Mama passed, everybody just went separate and the little boy just put everybody back together. Where I was that little boy, I just couldn't get everybody back together. And so, as I got older, I asked my mom, I, I never been to a family reunion, y'all tripping, y'all need to talk, like what's going on? And she told me exactly what happened. My grandmother had wrote her will. Mind you, my grandmother lived in the projects as well. And she just designated items on what each child was supposed to receive. And by the time my mother got home, there was a U-Haul truck already at my grandmother's house. And everyone disobeyed the list and just came and took, 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 took. And the only thing my, my mother got was my grandmother's Bible. So, fast forward along. I move into my new house. I bring this little interior decorator over. It was, I was single then. <laughs> so I bring this interior decorator over. And I don't even know the thing where you walk out the door with that little table. I said, I know exactly what I want to sit on this table. I said, I want to sit my grandmother's Bible on there. That'd be the first decoration. So I went to my mother's house and my mother had never touched the Bible, never opened the Bible, had it in storage. I said, Ma, I need that Bible. And she knew exactly how close me and my grandmother was. So she said, okay, fine. She gave me the Bible. Every day I walked out of the house, I used that Bible to pray before I come, before I go. One day I'm in a rush. And I run outside the house and my hip hit the table and the Bible fall over. And now I'm, I'm picking up the Bible. And if y'all know anything about old school grandmas and they Bible, they kept everything in that Bible. I just want no scriptures. And it was everything, recipes, birth, death certificates, everything. She had my little league schedule in there. And as I'm picking up her Bible, I see a letter. And I instantly become emotional because I hadn't seen my, my grandmother's handwriting. My grandmother passed when I'm 11. I'm a grown man now, so I'm looking at her handwriting. And it was her letter that she wrote on her deathbed. 
And the letter said, Dear God, please bless my kids. You know, he did this, he does this, she does this, she does this. Please take extra care of my mom, Hattie. She said, you know she's young, she's the baby, she gets really emotional. I kept reading the letter, and the last line of that letter said, and God, please bless my kids' kids, especially Puffy, which was me, because he's gonna be special someday. And that was the letter, and I took that letter to my, group, to my mom, I said, you need to call all of them, because they came back in the day and they took all those items, but you got the most valuable possession that you could ever receive. Look at this letter. And I ended up showing my mother that. Okay. And so my next step was I was finished playing basketball overseas. And I had to take a leap of faith. And that's one thing I'm telling all you 40 under 40 nominees right now. You, just because you're receiving this award tonight, that's not where you want to be. You ultimately have to take a leap of faith. And when I stopped playing, I had two job offers. One was $85,000 to be the assistant coach with my former coach, Greg Jackson. And one was to be a middle school basketball coach just for three months and make $675, which is $225 per month. <laughs> Let me say this. <laughs> so I went home and I, I prayed about it and the first person I told about it was my mom when I announced my decision. She said, what you gonna do when you going up to Delaware State? I said, I'm not going. I said, I'm gonna take this middle school job that pays $225 for three months. My mom looked directly at me and some of y'all know my mom. She said, you crazy as hell. <laughs> That's exactly what my mom said. But I knew somewhere in my heart I knew, just by being an individual that I felt I was anointed, I know success starts outside of your comfort zone. And going up there to make $85,000, that was comfortable, but I wanted to learn the game a completely different way. And something inside was telling me to take this job and just trust the process. So I ended up trusting the process, but I knew I had to stand alone. Fast forward, North Carolina Central calls me. People don't know this. I turned them down three times. I said, no, I'm good. No disrespect, I'm good. No thank you, I'm good. It wasn't until many of you know this lady, but a lady by the name who was just like my mom, even to this day, by the name of Luann Evans Harris. Luann said, we need you back up here. And I said, okay, I'll do it. I came back up here. And by then, I'm an assistant coach for two years, and we're making the transition, and we're getting our head beat. It was the worst two years of basketball of my life. We ended up, we ended up making a coaching change, and I'm stuck in a position. I'm saying, okay, what am I gonna do now? And my fiance at the time told me, won't you just apply for the position? I said, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna be the coach here at North Carolina Central. I was just part of the staff. We were probably the worst team in the history of Central University. I'm the youngest coach in here. They probably need someone who know what they're doing and gonna depend on. She said, well, you just pray about it and you put your name in the hot head. The worst thing they can do is say no. Well, I go through the interview process and I knew I interviewed really well. And then Dr. Chancellor Nams, Charlie Nams at that time, I'll never forget, he called me to the office. And he always rubbed his tie when he talked, and he never looked at you, he just did this all the time. He said, um, he said, man, I know you know about basketball. I know you know that like the back of your hand. He said, I just got one question. I got one concern about you. I was like, what's that? He said, how do I know you tough enough? And I looked at him, and I said, no disrespect, Chancellor. But I come from the lowest form of dysfunction a human being could possibly see. I said, every day I walked out of my house, I had to make a life or death decision. There was a possibility I wasn't gonna come back. I said, no disrespect, Chance, but my mother cleaned the houses for a living. And if you don't know what that's like as a little boy watching your mom come in that door with the mop and the broom, with no health benefits, no dental benefits, and got to do it all over again, and can't even afford a vacation, that makes you tough. I said, no disrespect, Chance. 
But my father left me when I was four years old. Walked slam out the door. He asked me what did I want from the store. I told him the next day I never saw him again. I said the next day I went in there asking my mom where is he. She said he gone, he ain't coming back. That was the message. I said when I was five he left a bike on the door with a ribbon around that bike. I said happy birthday Puffy. Never bothered to show his face. I said Chancellor, no disrespect. For 30 years I never rode that bike. And I never ride that bike. I said I've been hardened by life circumstances. So if I'm anything at all, I think I'm tough. Just walked out. The next day, Ingrid Wickham McCree called me. She said, you're the head coach of our university. This was March 25th, 2009. On March 26th, I almost was fired. I don't know if she remembered this, but she called me. The first day I'm at work, I'm happy. I got my desk, I'm cleaning, I'm, I'm ready. Just cleaned it. I don't know what I was doing. The youngest coach in the country just cleaned it. She called me on the phone. She said, hey, I need you to go to lunch today. I said, lunch with who? She said, I need you to go to lunch with one of our alums because he doesn't think you are qualified for this job. So I want you to go to lunch and show him that you're more than capable. And I said, boss lady, no disrespect. I'm not going to lunch with that man. Because him not liking me, him not believing in me, that's his problem, that's not my problem. My grandmama did tell me that they crucified Jesus and he was perfect, so what you think they are gonna do to you? So I said, boss lady, that's no disrespect, but one thing I have learned in life, the people that trust you will never ask you to explain. And the people that ask you to explain will never trust you anyway, so I said, I just can't do that. The next day we had our press conference. And I just remember asking God for four things. And I said, I God, I really need you to help me out here. I don't really know what I got myself into. I went in there and interviewed to these people and told them some of everything. <laughs> so I said, I might as well repeat it to you, because I know you ain't bought me this far. And I said, here's the four things I need from you. And I said this at my press conference. You can go back and look at the transcript. I said, if you guys hire me in five years, We'll do four things. The first thing we'll do will be the ACC school. People were mumbling, like, at least have a winning season, for, at least win a game first. You're talking about ACC school. I said, the second thing, if you hire me in five years, we'll win a MEAC championship. I said, the third thing, we'll go to the final four. And the fourth thing, I said, God, I really need you for you to make North Carolina Central a national program because NCCU only matters to people in HBCU community and people around here. When I go to California, I want people to understand what that NCCU acronym stood for. And that was my four prayers. And when I walked out of there, I went to coach. We beat NC State one day. That was the ACC. The next one, we won the MEAC championship. A lot of people don't know this. We were up nine points with nine seconds left. And one of our kids got fired. And he went to the free throw line. And you kind of, as a coach, you kind of feel like, okay, maybe we got this one. And it was the crazy guy. It was the only game in my life I've never been nervous for. I was nervous every game when I played. I'm nervous every game as a coach. And before the game, I was like, all right, now let me get some nervousness in here because it just didn't feel right. But with nine seconds, our kid went to the free throw line. And I was just staring at her. And all I hear is my grandmother's voice. Saying, didn't I tell you? I'm so proud of you. I told you. And I just lost it. And I look up at the Jumbotron. And they got me on the Jumbotron crying. It's like a loud eruption and everybody's looking at it. And everybody thinks I'm so emotional because we won our first championship. And I was like, look, I love NCCU more than anybody. But I won championships before. That wasn't why I was emotional. It was simply because of my grandmother. The last thing 
that we're working on right now is the final four. Now, I don't want to come up here begging because it's day night, but I'm going to need a little more money from y'all to get that final four. <laughs> now, we'll get to that one. We'll get to that one. But what I soon discovered right after us winning the championship, we were in Jet Magazine, we was in Forbes, we was in Black Enterprise. I went to LA to an event. I'm sitting at a table where Ray Lewis and said the entertainer. First thing they said, man, hey, you that coach from North Carolina Central, ain't you? Man, I'm a fan. And I'm looking like, wow, what in the world? How's your son, et cetera, et cetera. I'm in Atlanta. I'm at a basketball event, jam-packed with people. Security guard come tap me on the shoulder. He said, sir, I need you to come with me real fast. I said, man, I can't leave because I might lose my seat. I'm in here watching the kid. He said, sir, trust and believe. I need you to come with me. You can leave your stuff here, but I'll be right back. I couldn't leave my stuff because it looked like they were stealing down there. So <laughs> I was upset, so I took my book bag and I, he said, come with me and follow me. I go back in the back room. And when I get back there, there's a guy about from here to that projector. And as soon as I walk in the room, he said, LaVille, boom. I was like, who is this? And he had his hat down and it was low. And as I get closer, he said, look, man, I know you out there recruiting. But I just want to tell you, you and Shaka Smart, my favorite two coaches in the world, man. He said, I'm a basketball fanatic. So he said, man, I just called my security guard to meet you. He said, it's a pleasure. It was Jamie Foxx. And I told my wife on the way home, when I got home, God had made my program a national program. I'll leave you with this. All you 40 under 40 nominees, I will leave you with this because I don't know what's going through your mind, but I knew what was going through my mind when I sat in that position. I always remember dates. And one date I will never forget as a kid is April the 1st, 1984. Now let me take some of y'all back because some of y'all look a little young. <laughs> April 1st, 1984 in the housing projects. We had one phone. Won't know the cordless phone. It was the one with the cord that could extend from here to that door. <laughs> and back then when they called your house phone, that phone only stopped ringing for two reasons. Either you answered it or they hung up. That was your two options. And at 10, I won't jump in and get the phone because I knew it won't for me. So the phone is ringing. It's probably like on the 40th time. And I'm just looking at my mom like, I'm not answering or whatever. She said, boy, go get the phone. Because it's been ringing all day off the hook. She's like, whoever it is, tell them I ain't here. It's her best friend, Faith, from upstairs. She like, Puffy, where your mom at? She got this sense of urgency voice. I said, she said she's not here. <laughs> She said, I know she there because I see you, I see you window downstairs and I see your car out there. So I was like, Mom, she said, come to the phone. So my mom mad, she get up, go to the phone. She watching something, not slanting or something on TV. So I get to the phone and I give it to my mom. And I hear Faye coming through the phone. And all I hear is my mom's face just change. She's like, what? No, girl, no, he ain't. Tell me you lying. Fellas, y'all know that conversation your mama be having. And then she covered the phone and she said, Vin, run to your grandma that Marvin Gaye just died. My grandma lived in the projects like three blocks away. So I put my shoes on and I run to my grandma's house. And my grandma had the door open. I kick in the door. I said, Grandma, Grandma, Grandma. She's like, boy, what's wrong with you? She was cooking. And I hugged. I said, Ma told me to tell you grandma, that Marvin Gaye died. She said, what? She ran and cut the TV on. We only had three channels. ABC, NBC, and CBS. I'm glad you're with me. Some of y'all are too up in here. Y'all here. Let me turn my back. Y'all had cable in the 80s. Oh, huh? Y'all had cable in the 80s. Y'all had cable in the 80s. And if you were really fortunate, you had the U channel where you could take the top knot and put it on, okay. See, y'all still too up here. I need something on right by y'all when I walk in. They got sugar and ATO over here. We drink before. But my grandma turned the TV on and it's the news. And they're doing a special right there on Marvin Gaye. And she turned the TV on and we sit on the couch. 
And as they go to commercial break, they say, let's have a moment of silence for Marvin Gaye. And I'll never forget this moment in my life. As they go to commercial break, his picture pop up on the screen. And his birthday, April 2nd, 1939, through April 1st, 1984. And my grandmother said, you see that? She said, the birthday, that don't matter. The death day, that don't matter. The only thing that matters is that little dash. Because that's your legacy, that's your impact, and that's how people will remember you the day that you leave this earth, so don't ever forget that. I'm standing before you today because I've carried all those things with me. There's nothing special about me. The only thing special about me, I made up my mind I was gonna be special. When I was a young kid, my grandmother always told me, I pray for my kids' kids because you'll see one day. I now realize that kids' kids was me. This is a story about faith, favor, and purpose. I'm not gonna come at you like I'm the perfect Christian. You will soon realize that the moment the referee make a bad call anyway. <laughs> but I do want to tell you that I stand before you as a happy man. I found happiness because I found my purpose in life. I understand that the two most important days of my life is the day that I was born and the day I figure out why and I figured out why. And I encourage you today to figure out why. Because if you still have the idea that happiness is somewhere else, it would never be where you are. Happiness is a way of life. It's not a destination, so you can't go out there chasing anything. I want you to tap, tap into your purpose. I challenge all you 40 under 40 guys today and girls to tap into your purpose. And so many times people don't tap into their purpose because we get all these degrees, we get sophisticated, we get some money in the bank, and we think we live in life, but we go home and we look in that mirror and that person in that mirror ain't smiling back at us because we're not serving God's purpose. Because we're trying to connect our purpose to what we do. And I'm here to tell you, your career, and I've read all your titles, that's cool. But your career is what you get paid to do. Your calling is what you were made to do. And before you leave here tonight, tap into yourself and ask yourself, what is my purpose for being on this earth? Because once you find your purpose, you're gonna come up here, you're gonna see this, you're gonna get this award, you're gonna go home, you're gonna take a nice little picture, you're gonna post it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or whatever, then it's gonna collect dust. And now what you gonna do with it? Because once you get your purpose, you'll understand that you don't live on this earth for yourself. People ask me all the time, why did I make it? It's very simple. My dream was never about me. Because if it was about me, I would have stopped a long time ago because when your dream is about you, you had a propensity to quit on yourself. We do it all the time. How many New Year's resolutions you broke? How many diets you done started and stopped? How many times you said you're gonna work out and you done stopped and said, I'll do that next Monday? But I never quit because I'm committed. I'm committed to servicing my last name. I'm committed to servicing my grandmother. My grandmother has made the ultimate investment in, on me. My mother has done that, and I have to give them a return on that investment. So the people that's here supporting you, those are the people that's invested in you, and I encourage you before you leave here to find your purpose. And when you leave here, fulfill it. God bless you and your kids' kids. Thank you.